Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters. And just a reminder, you can always find us on BCTV, our Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page, as well as our website and on Apple Podcasts and Spotify even these days which is pretty exciting. I want to welcome to the show regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser. Hi, Emily. Hi, Olga. And I also want to uh, welcome back to the show fellow representative, Laura Sibelia, who is an independent rep from the Wyndham Bennington District, and she serves on the House Committee on Energy and Technology, which is great because we're going to be talking about conductivity today. And um, that's kind of where you've been focusing for quite a few terms, it seems, Laura. Broadband, mm-hmm. yeah, yes. connectivity. Yes. And we're probably going to touch a little bit today on H360, which seeks to accelerate the, the rollout of community broadband uh, initiatives and infrastructure and also support community union districts called, we, we will refer to them as CUDs. Um, And just a little background, in 2019, the state authorized the creation of these uh, districts. And I would love to hear, Laura, if we could just start quickly for those who don't know, what are community union districts and why do they work for Vermont when it comes to reaching that last mile for broadband? Awesome. Well, good morning and uh, happy to be here talking about one of my favorite subjects, uh, the communications union districts and and the expansion of broadband out to the last mile. So uh, Vermont does have um, a fully operational uh, providing uh, broadband CUD that is functioning right now. And that is EC Fiber. A lot of folks have probably heard of that. uh, up in East Central Vermont, um, more than 20 towns have connected together um, and uh, and planned and provided broadband uh, for every address. They build out um, by town and they build out 100% of the under uh, underserved and unserved addresses. And uh, that project and that effort has been underway for uh, more than a decade. Uh, and you know, they have had their own trials and tribulations uh, standing up and uh, figuring things out. And uh, the state of Vermont is really a huge beneficiary because of that. Um, You know, in 2019, as you said, we passed Act 79. And and that was really uh, our response, the legislature's response to um, seeing that uh, our legacy phone providers were starting to, you know, those copper networks were starting to fail and we just were not able to get our providers, uh, our internet service providers to cover the last mile. And it was time to really tell our, um, our Vermonters, our towns, our residents, the truth of the situation, which is we can't make these guys do it. And also we don't have the money to do it. And we can see uh, this is becoming increasingly more urgent. And so uh, it's, it's up to you. Right now, it's up to you. And what we're going to work on is how we can support you. What are the tools that we can put together? And one of the first ones was uh, planning and support tools for the development of CUDs. Uh, we put in place funds for towns uh, to utilize, to plan out networks when they formed a CUD. And we put in place a person at the Department of Public Service, uh, Mr. Rob Fish, to uh, to work and support uh, these towns, which were all going to have similar, you know, challenges or questions or opportunities as they were standing up to help support them, and uh, and that worked. That worked. We have nine CUDs now uh, in the state, and uh, almost more than two hundred of our towns are either part of a CUD or part of a CUD study area. So. It's pretty remarkable. Vermonters are amazing. Of course, we know. That, so. What was helpful for me to learn just like very big picture about the structure of them mm-hmm. is that this idea of a union district isn't something that's new in the communication union district, right? We have our schools, um, our school districts, and the way multiple towns are voting members of a what is essentially a municipality. Yes. Um, is one way we do that. Our, we often have trash districts 
um, which we call solid waste districts. We don't call them trash districts. Right. And that's another way that like, you know, towns vote to join together um, into a governance structure. And so it's, it's a very sort of Vermont mechanism for collaborating across our strong towns in the absence of county government. Right, right. In the absence of county government. So we figure out specific solutions for problems uh, and, and ways that towns can collaborate. So, yeah. And Laura, remind me, you, you talked about the sense of urgency around uh, connectivity and if I remember correctly, we talked about this once before and part of your, your concern and, and what brought you to this issue was not just whether or not people could stream YouTube, but whether or not people could actually make phone calls in an emergency because some mm -hmm. of our infrastructure has become that fragile. Yes. Am I remembering that correctly? You are absolutely remembering that correctly. That was, uh, you know, that was uh, the, the straw that broke the camel's back for me is, you know, the phone call from uh, my constituent who had just had surgery, who was, you know, uh, disabled and had made their way to the town clerk's office um, because they needed to have a doctor's appointment. They couldn't make a phone call from their home. They needed to have somebody from the, uh, from the school uh, uh, reach out, you know, uh, help them with the phone. And, you know, and, and I was asking them to, um, to email me information because that's how I had been um, dealing with problems um, with phone service. And of course they couldn't do that. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was really too much, you know, like we can't even, folks can't even call for help. Like this, this, this woman, you know, she's just a regular person who's just had surgery and she's rural Vermonter away from her doctor and she can't even like speak with her doctor um, who is 30 minutes away and as is the ambulance, you know, so just too much. And for me, yes, that became the sense of, you know, this is a public safety issue, you know, and this is before COVID, which I think, you know, once COVID hit, uh, many of my colleagues uh, really also started to, or continued to see how urgent that was. So mm -hmm. I, think it's I think it's universal now, understanding mm -hmm. that we need universal broadband, so. Definitely, thank you. And so H360, it seeks to roll, to kind of accelerate the rollout of these CUDs. Um, tell us what, extra support CUDs have needed now that many of them have kind of gone through the initial phase of the study area and they're, they're kind of at the implementation stage. What were some of the barriers they were bouncing up against? Well, uh, opportunities and challenges, right? So these are our, these are volunteer organizations. Um, as I said, you know, we put in place support for them to form. We put in place uh, dollars for them to plan, which, you know, no one likes to plan, uh, you know, in my regular job, uh, you know, we do some planning as well. Um, and we know that, you know, it's, it's really never a case that, um, you know, that we can't get money, we just can't get money. It's because we don't have a good plan to get something funded. Um, and so we put in place these dollars to get these plans done. And so as these CUDs are starting to build their plans and they've got their teams in place and they're interacting and, you know, there's more additional resources coming in through COVID. And now, you know, they're ready to build out. And, um, you know, I think about it, we've talked about it uh, in our committee, uh, the way we think about things at my regular job, you know, it's kind of, we need to develop um, it's business development um, it's build out and um, putting together the financing to, um, to, to build the network out. And um, we know that all of these CUDs are now going to need that assistance. Um, it's, you know, and it's, it's not so much, you know, where are we going to get the money as it is, how are we going to put the funds that are available in multiple different places together to build out? And how are we going to stage that and implement that? And what are the resources that are going to be needed over and over and over again for each CUD? So that's there's, the, there's the phase of formation that's just volunteers and, you know, a few paid professionals sometimes coming together to say, like, what does it mean for us to govern together, collaborate together, get something done together? And most communities have significant experience with that part. 
But then there's the next phase, which is, wait a minute, we're actually going to be essentially running a business together across multiple towns. And so how do we build the business case? How do we do business surveys? How do we understand how many people at what phase of rollout are going to be interested in buying into this? How, you know, what does our price point need to be in order for people to be interested in this? And how do we cover our costs? Um, because the hope is while we'll have, we're hoping for significant public financing for rollout, mm -hmm. the sustained service is ideally going to be covered by whatever fees that people are paying for internet access. Mm -hmm. And so all of that, um, both like really highly technical and business acumen is fairly similar, the process from community to community from community to community. So having really good technical assistance in place so that people aren't reinventing the wheel on that over and over again, is really helpful. Right. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that's one thing I find so interesting about these CUDs is they, for me, are in, uh, the intersection of really how clever Vermont can be when it's, it's working on those economies of scale that are kind of different for a small rural community than say a large urban community. And yet it also points to how much we expect from our communities mm -hmm. in, in their own problem solving. And not that that's a bad thing, but that's, that's a big lift. And that's a big ask with, with putting together basically what is a municipality at, by volunteers. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's, it is, uh, it is, uh, they're really remarkable. There's, there are uh, 300 Vermonters at this point engaged in these CUDs um, and some, you know, a lot of familiar faces to, um, to our communities. I think we're really, we're really, really fortunate. You know, and, and one of the pieces I think that we don't talk about enough is um, uh, when Tim Briglin and I in the off session, you know, we were kind of setting the objectives, you know, like what, Tim was really clear, you know, like it, we, this Tim is chair of the yes, chair of our committee, yes. And also um, lives in EC Fiberland, uh, right. Uh, and, you know, he, he was really clear in speaking, you know, with a lot of the, a lot of the stakeholders here, you know, for us, the goal is it's like electricity. You just expect every, you know, every address is going to have this uh, and electricity. They're gonna be connected and have electricity. And for me, it was around accountability that we had to put in place systems that, uh, that we could finally uh, do something that we can, Vermonters had some means of actually getting this job done because we've been so stymied by these national for-profit um, entities and, and political forces that um, you know, have really worked hard to keep this for-profit and unregulated. So uh, that's the other aspect of the CUDs that makes me really, really happy, relieved, honestly, you know, is this, this local accountability to making sure that we get the job done. So, so what is different? Because this is not Vermont's first attempt to connect the last mile, for lack of a better term. Um, under the Shumlin administration, a few initiatives were, were launched. And... To, to varying degrees of success, I would say. What makes the CUDs different from, and, and potentially more successful than some of our past attempts? I think the biggest thing is what Laura just said. It's about the accountability. It's that we're saying that like, this is, these are community problems and we're gonna find community solutions. And even if we have to contract out some of the technical or infrastructure work, that will be a contract that's accountable to Vermont communities. Exactly. We are not, we are not just turning over state money to a national interest that, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, on the very detail level, like one of my internet providers that I've had before in Vermont, I had to call every single month to get them to bring my bill back to the bill that was in my, back to the level that was in my contract. Every month we had to call and there's no, there was no other mechanism beyond that. Um, there, you know, in some ideal version of capitalism, if that was happening, I would be able to choose another provider and that would somehow create accountability. But that's not true here at all. Mm -hmm. And in another version of capitalism, there would be a regulator, regulatory apparatus 
which is also not true here because we're really prohibited from regulating it at the federal level. And so what we have left is that we need like real community accountability because that's, that's mm -hmm. what's before us. I think the other difference between previous attempts is also that um, a lot more people understand we need this than mm. did under those previous attempts. Right. Yeah, I, I would say so. And, you know, even prior to the Shumlin administration, you know, we previously, we've had the VTA in place, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the VTA and then all of these stimulus dollars. And the VTA's mission um, was to build public infrastructure um, in hopes that private providers would utilize it to get to the last mile, right? So they built out some um, fiber loops and uh, they built out some small, um, some cell phone towers, um, but you know, it was with the intention of these private providers accessing it. And that is not what we are doing here. Um, in 360, we do stand up a new entity, uh, the Community Broadband Authority, um, but this entity's purpose and mission is to support the build out, the financing and build out of the networks that are being designed by our, our, uh, our communications union districts. And that's distinctly different than what we had um, done in the past. Uh, and you know, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that came in in the past also, um, uh, in 2008, the ERA funds, uh, those, it gets me worked up every time I start talking about it. Uh, those, those dollars, um, you know, those dollars, not only did they not get the job done, but they actually served as a barrier to getting the job done for a number of years because uh, the federal government determined that those projects, that it, that where those places were, uh -huh. yeah, that the problem had been solved, that they were covered. You know, places where the, where the work was to have been done was done, and it was not done. Also, you know, this massive, we had some massive um, infrastructure builds, which were great, um, but now you can't access them. They're, you know, in the control of a private for-profit company, you know, charging a lot of dollars, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of public funds that went in, and, you know, it's pretty distressing to me, actually, you know, I, I you know, we're, we're getting things done here um, in Vermont, the state level, but, you know, this policy at the federal level, we need some really significant um, turnaround in the policy mm -hmm. at the, at the federal level, because uh, this is not, you know, this, this should not be regulated, like, you know, goods, uh, this is critical infrastructure that every uh, American citizen needs access to, and it needs to be regulated in that way. And, you know, this nonsense that we see at the federal level, um, the hundreds of millions of dollars that these private providers are investing just to not be regulated <laughs> makes me wild. That's not what we're doing here. We're getting around it here. <laughs> we're around it. <laughs> One other... Um, piece that I think is really interesting that happened with this bill that just passed and is happening in a bunch of other bills that we're putting forward right now, but I think it's the most um, explicit in the broadband bill, is setting, is a, you know, a very strong awareness that more and more federal money is going to be coming our way under the Biden administration, especially infrastructure dollars. And so it's really setting up a framework so our communities are as ready as possible to be receiving those funds. So it's not about necessarily um, spending the money right now. It's about being ready to receive dollars as they come and to use them as efficiently and equitably and effectively as possible. And that's, a, I think that's some of the best work that we're doing right now as a legislature is really setting those plans in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've done the work to kind of get that, get to this point to be ready to do that. Mm -hmm. And I will add one other thing that is kind of really cool about 360 is, um, you know, these CUDs are serving really as coordinators, but hoping that we have all comers, you know, anyone who's providing service uh, in the state, any of the large providers at all can work with these CUDs, but also um, our electric utilities. There are, there's mechanisms uh, in here for our utilities to work. There are things that are happening outside of this bill. Um, with GMP and Vermont Electric Co-op that are happening to help uh, build this out. So, uh, you know, we had um, leading into the session, as I said, you know, in talking with stakeholders, you know, some folks saying we really need a team Vermont approach. And I think that we have the groundwork here 
for a team Vermont approach, you know, uh, all commerce to be able to come together and get this done, working with Vermonters, which is awesome. Emily, I'm curious, you and I have talked endlessly on this show about COVID and systems and what can we learn from COVID? So we, we come back uh, more resilient. Mm -hmm. How do you see the CUDs, if at all, kind of fitting into that discussion? Um, I think it's interesting because this was is sort of one area of policy that we were most prepared to experience the lessons of COVID with. Uh, so um, lesson of COVID, we all need internet in our houses so that we can have school and health care, right? Um, but we were sort of ready for that lesson to come because we'd been taught, really Laura had been talking about this for so long along with a few other people. Um, lesson two, our communities are really good at coming together and you know, organizing and the mutual aid networks that we saw during COVID is one example of that. And the communication union districts are a much more formal version of that. Um, and then that Vermont can do a lot, but in the end we actually need federal spending to get it done. Um, and that is also a huge lesson of COVID that we could do, we could be resilient, we could be strong, we could take care of each other, but federal dollars are very different than state dollars and we need them and that's okay. Um, but we need to be ready for them and we need to be ready to use them effectively. And throughout COVID, I think we've done an incredibly good job of the way we've spent federal dollars and very different from some other states. Um, you know, in the first package of COVID money that came and the way we spent it for housing and healthcare and um, really meeting people's basic needs is very different than the way a lot of other states spent their money. And so in the second package, we saw signs that like, oh my God, all of these other states have people on the edge of eviction and Vermont's doing something a little different. So I think those are sort of the biggest lessons. And I think we're gonna be carrying them forward um, with this, maybe not with everything. Um, we learned a lot of lessons this last year, but. I think with the communication union districts, we're really ready to ready to fly. Great, thank you. We have just about five minutes before we need to hear from some of our underwriters. So Laura, any thoughts or concepts you wanna leave listeners with before we, we head out for the break? Well, you know, uh, I guess I would speak to um, some of the some of the concerns that folks have um, around that immediacy of this problem and the fact that, you know, we're not gonna have fiber tomorrow. Uh, and that's, that's true, that is true. Um, but uh, we are going to have it soon. Um, there is, this effort is really concerted. Um, we have put in place throughout the state, um, there are emergency Wi-Fi um, areas um, and, uh, and, and this, this work will roll out. I think we'll see, we'll see a pretty significant difference you know, in three to five years um, in terms of uh, coverage. Uh, there are, um, there are uh, some concerns um, about affordability as well that I have heard um, with this and why aren't we focusing more on affordability? Um, Two things I would say about that. First of all, uh, fiber can, uh, you can have voice over IP, so that's your phone. Uh, you can stream your TV uh, and you can have internet. And for a lot of people, that's three bills right now they're paying, you know, and, the, and then we go to fiber. So um, I think there's a pretty significant affordability element there. And also uh, the federal government has put in place um, a pretty massive, um, short-term affordability subsidy. And this kind of goes back to the whole um, issue of how the private providers have been able to um, manipulate the conversation and keep themselves kind of in the driver's seat, literally. Uh, you know, prior to the Recovery Act, um, the, uh, the, the bill that had passed prior to that, we had learned that, you know, there were significant funds in there for the build out of broadband infrastructure. Um, you know, pretty flexible, um, going to states and would have worked really well in Vermont. You know, we had heard, you know, perhaps up to $100 million and we were, you know, ready as we've been talking about. 
Um, and within four days, uh, those funds, it was $3.2 billion with a B at the um, federal level. Within four days of hearing that, those funds had been uh, removed from that program and put into a program uh, called Lifeline, uh, which is an affordability um, for folks that um, meet certain uh, income thresholds or have um, some uh, um, other challenges in life that they that they need to overcome. And so, 3.2 billion was put into a $50 a month temporary subsidy um, for. Um, for citizens to pay, uh, the rules have come out now, to pay virtually any of their internet ser service providers or phone providers uh, bills. And so in Vermont, uh, the largest recipient of those funds will be consolidated uh, and, and perhaps Comcast, uh, which, is, um, which is great, uh, which is great. So uh, pretty, um, pretty significant amount of funds went to affordability as opposed to building out. And so we can, you know, we can do the affordability issue forever and never get there. We have to build the infrastructure uh, so that it's truly affordable and, you know, in the long term, uh, you know, so we have infrastructure that is capable of delivering multiple services. So. Thank you. We are going to just step off so we can hear from some of our underwriters here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. The Montpelier Happy Hour will return in a moment. Thanks. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you are just joining us, I'm your host, Olga Peters. And I'm speaking today with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, as well as representative Laura Sibelia. And we are talking about broadband and connectivity and community union districts. And Emily, talk to us about affordability in this whole issue. Yes, and it's communication union district. Oh, what did I say? Well, community? You say community, which is nice. I like it. It's an, it sounds good. Um, yes. And some of, our newer, <laughs> some of our newer colleagues from the house have started saying in CUD instead of C-U-D. And just in case any of them listen to this or anyone else listens to this, don't say that. Just say C-U-D. CUD is very awkward. That's not. Monty, but awkward. I love calling them CUDs to myself, but yes. Yeah, but let's awesome. say, you know, let's say C-U-D. So um, I think one of the interesting pieces about affordability is that up until this point, when we talked about broadband affordability and, um, what that looked like and even through the beginning of the pandemic, it was specific plans that were set aside for lower income folks um, that they could access for say $10 a month. And they were terrible connections. Like kids couldn't learn on the internet connection that slow. And most contemporary website, like even if you live in a place that actually had build out and had that level of good connectivity, the plan that you were able to purchase that was the affordability plan was much too slow to actually use. And so that really like is one significant way that we were continuing to expand the digital divide between people. So even if you happen to be able to afford to live in a community that had real build out, the plan you were able to afford was really didn't work at all for anything that, you know, people wanted to do in a dynamic way. And then we also have the fact that, you know, for the most part, um, say Dover notwithstanding, the housing in say. our, the housing okay. in our fringe, in our community sort of outside of um, our larger towns is less expensive. And so as we're moving into communities that are less expensive to live in, we tend to have much less broadband access. And so that is another sort of real challenge around affordability and connectivity and equity um, that full last mile build out will make good on. And so I think once we have that build out in place and as we continue the build out, we can look at not necessarily connecting price to speed but connecting price to someone's ability to afford or um, subsidizing that in some way and the way we subsidize other things. But having speed go with price is really um, not in anyone's best interest. 
And if we're doing this on a community level, we're able to make decisions like that, which is not what happens when these decisions are made outside of our communities. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That is the work that, um, for instance, you know, our Wyndham County uh, CUD, uh, the DV Fiber, it's called, uh, you know, they have uh, an RFP out right now looking for um, looking for a partner to to build out, um, you know, their first priority towns, um, and uh, and they'll start negotiating, which will be um, fantastic. And it's uh, you know, looking at things exactly like what Emily's talking about, you know, what. What are your maintenance and, and costs and, you know, how quickly and, and who and uh, how many tiers, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. so I just want to um, remind folks who may not be from Vermont, because um, we do have some lovely listeners tune in from Canada and, and over in Europe and such. One of the things we're, we're dealing with is um, the lack of choice. Uh, is one of the things that's kind of driving a lot of these conversations. So for example, when I moved to a new apartment and I needed to set up broadband, I could choose between Comcast and Comcast and Comcast. <laughs> like that was it. And, and for other areas of the, the town or the state, it might be a different provider, but that's, if you get any choice, it's that it's one provider. And so that just changes, um, as Emily was saying with, with capitalism and the free market, if I don't like what my provider is, is charging or the service they're offering, my choice is no, no internet or them. Right. So I just, I wanted to put that out there in case if, in case folks are, are just like, well, why don't you just go to a different provider? Why are you mad at these national providers? <laughs> well, and this is exactly the issue around the regulation. And, uh, you know, if we did have choice, then you would have, uh, you know, these entities competing with each other to, you know, on rates and on tiers and quality. I mean, all of it, you know, and, and the fact of the matter is, yeah, in rural Vermont, like, yeah, a rural America, you know, it's a farce that there's competition. And that's, and that is the system that by which, um, you know, these national providers want to be regulated. They want to be regulated by the Federal Trade Commission, actually, you know, as opposed to the FCC and being regulated like a utility. So, yes. So, Rattleboro is a little bit different. Um, and I think it's worth naming that. So, mm -hmm. most areas of Rattleboro have at least two providers you can choose from. Ooh. Um, <laughs> I live way out on a dirt road in Brattleboro, but I still have two providers I can choose from. Um, and they're both like fairly decent speeds. Um, one of them is, a you know, one of them said it would take three months to come to my house when I needed an upgrade. And so I went with the other one. Um, but that doesn't mean that the folks who live in Brattleboro wouldn't really substantially benefit from a public option for this um, in terms of, you know, trustworthiness, in terms of getting into all corners, that exactly what we said, that real accountability piece and ideally, you know, price too. Um, but what I've been really enjoying when we've had conversations about this is when we talk about build out, everyone describes towns like Brattleboro as a donut hole, um, meaning that we're gonna be, all of the build out is gonna happen in the communities around Brattleboro and Brattleboro will be one of the last towns to get connected this way, which one I think is fun because we usually get stuff first. And so it's good for us to have to wait sometimes, um, you know, helps us build resiliency and patience and all of those really important life skills. But the other piece of it um, is that in the outlying towns, you, you're going to have a much faster take up rate from consumers because this is a brand new service versus in a town like Brattleboro where it might take me a while to like get it together to opt over to a different option because you know I already have a thing that sort of works and life is hard and I don't really need more things to deal with. So because our take up rate is gonna be probably some of the lowest and the slowest in terms of people really choosing to switch their business over to this public option, um, we, we get to be the last to provide to get services, which doesn't mean we won't. And the town of Brattleboro has been really very much active at the table for the communication unit district for quite a while. And they're really excited to have it happen. But that's, 
that's sort of something that's happening all over the state that the um, downtowns that are already wired up are um, at the table, but are going to be the last in line. Yeah. But even in Brattleboro, you know, you've got just in the town itself, you've got the donut hole strategy happening, right? Yeah. So, I mean, like out where you live, you know, you don't have great options out there yeah. either, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, building out, um, even building out where uh, where you are will be a priority. And that's that's how these CUDs, um, you know, at least that's how EC Fiber has operated. They have not chosen to build out uh, and go head to head with say Comcast, uh, who can, you know, they can put out some crazy temporary rates, you know, and if, if that's where your CUD is going first, you know, that's gonna be pretty harmful. Um, you know, why go head to head with them? You know, as Emily is saying, you know, you build this network from folks that really need it and then and then it's available. You have to get there by going through the donut hole. So, um, you know, as folks come on, you know, they, then you do start seeing more choice. Um, I love that the ones it's like, the folks who need it most are gonna get it first. I think that's pretty cool. That's not necessarily how the world always works. And I'm so sorry, Emily, your your audio got a little funny there. Could you repeat what you just said? I was saying that I think it's nice that for once the folks who need it most to get it first, because that's not how the world usually works. That was worth repeating. Thank you. <laughs> what if it wasn't? What would you have said? I would have said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I understand it, H360 is now in Senate finance. So it has passed out of the House and moved over to the Senate. Um, is the Senate working on anything similar or is this the only bill of its type right now moving through the, the state house? So uh, we have been talking with the Senate a lot about our bill, um, a number of senators. Um, and so we think that there's a pretty decent understanding of our bill. Uh, there is an other, another bill that has also been introduced um, in the Senate uh, that uh, that also looks at standing up an entity. Um, it really seeks to revive the Vermont Telecommunications Authority. Uh, and as you'll recall, um, you know, I, I said that that entity in the past was intended to build public infrastructure and you know, to kind of incent the build out um, uh, in that way uh, by having private providers hook, hook into it. Um, and S-118, um, I think, has similar, has similar objectives, um, but I think it also seeks to move um, some of the, or many of the functions of the Department of Public Service Telecommunications Division um, over to uh, the Community Broadband Authority. And um, so we'll see. Um, we obviously in the House like our bill. Um, <laughs> I think one of the funny things, I don't know if this is interesting to listeners, but it's sort of fascinating to me. So, Laura, you know, I'm on Ways and Means, Laura's on Energy and Technology. Our two committees joined together in the Senate to become one committee, um, right. the Finance Committee, which also handles all of the insurance issues that the Commerce Committee handles in the House. Um, so they have really significantly less time to focus deeply on the details of these issues than um, we might have in the house. And, you know, for all of the time that they spend on broadband means that they'll leave tax issues to the house. So um, pros and cons, and that but just thing? like, you know, just a little inside baseball for people who made it this far into the podcast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping that they focus more on tax issues this year though, Emily, I really am. <laughs> We were a little low. <laughs> uh, should we start a betting pool about? Uh, oh, I would win. So we're, we're good. They, they really prefer working on broadband to working on taxes. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a timeline at all? So for everyone who's who's sitting home going, I love broadband. Um, do we have a timeline at all for some of these uh, CUDs? So if everything breaks correctly in terms of timing um, and we are able to stand this, communication, uh, this communications broadband uh, authority up, um, community broadband authority up, um, we, uh, we could see um, the Wyndham County CUD is, is in probably the 
probably in the third position, third or fourth position in the state in, in terms of just readiness. It's not really a race against the other CUDs, but just in terms of who's readiest. And uh, the Wyndham County CUD is pretty ready. There is a chance that, uh, you know, late fall this year, we could see in some of our priority towns um, service um, being delivered. Um, because CUD, what's that? I didn't know it was that soon. That's really soon. If everything breaks right, if everything does not break right, you know, it'll be next spring, it'll be next building season. But um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Places like Halifax, Reedsboro, Stanford, um, Marlboro, you know, uh, these are some of the priority towns, Wardsboro, these are some of the priority towns um, you know, here for DB Fiber. Yeah, it's really freaking awesome. <laughs> so when we're talking about infrastructure, can we say as everything comes together, um, rather than everything breaks because. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Let's just point. be on the safe side. <laughs> yeah. Excellent point. Excellent. So what yeah. piece that's oh. been interesting to me as we've talked about build out and like what the actual infrastructure piece looks like is um, that often this work is done in collaboration with electrical utilities. Mm -hmm. And down here in Brattleboro, we have Green Mountain Power and that sort of seems normal. They're like, you know, a private monopoly and like big one and they do some really nice such stuff for energy efficiency and you know multinational corporation all those things owned by a multinational corporation but but like you know a kinder friendlier one and but in a lot of other areas of the state we still have this legacy of electric build out from what when did we build electricity in vermont is that the i think 30s? the last home 30s. was electrified yes. in the 50s or 60s okay. So we have these like really small, cool electric co-ops um, in various places in Vermont who all have a very different arrangement with themselves and with their communities and all have a very different capacity and interest in doing this work around broadband. And so that's a fun, like extra piece of flexibility that needs to be in the mix of the policy is when we're thinking about who, who's gonna own the infrastructure. Phone companies as well. We have um, a bunch of um, independent telephone providers. Not so much in Southern Vermont. You know, in Southern Vermont, we've got Green, Green Mountain Power and Consolidated, but uh, up in the kingdom, up in, you know, what, the central Vermont, you know, a lot of little telephone companies, a lot of little uh, electric utilities. And, you know, I, I see those, I think they're anxious. A number of them are anxious about, you know, what does this mean? And is somebody going to compete with us? And, you know, we've had these territories and we're little and, you know, we can't take a lot of, but to me, those, those entities are, are key. And when we talk about Team Vermont, I mean, I'm really hopeful that we see those folks really, really lean in here and, um, and figure it out with our CUDs because that's like the dream scenario, you know? So. Mm -hmm. Um, since these CUDs are essentially supposed to be able to develop and roll out and fit whatever communities they're serving, are you seeing, um, can you talk to us a little bit, like say Bennington and Wyndham counties, are you seeing different ways they're approaching the problem or anything that are similar, different, that, that sort of thing? So Bennington County is much more heavily we call it cabled than uh, Wyndham County and it's smaller uh, Bennington County than Wyndham County. So their initial plan actually recommends that they merge with either the Wyndham County CUD um, or they could be looking to the North um, and to Rutland. Rutland's a little bit further behind in terms of readiness, but they're coming together. And so, uh, so that's, that's a, that's a difference. Um, just in terms of is there enough, are there enough unserved um, Vermonters living in those Bennington County towns to make this worthwhile? And so the, the Wyndham County CUD is looking at um, the same uh, region that um, our regional entities look at. So mm -hmm. that will include Bennington County towns as well, right? So Stanford and Reedsboro, um, Windhall, is Windhall Bennington or is that Windsor? Anyway. Um, it's, you know, kind of breaks that way. <clears throat> so, um, so this wow. side of the basically. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, with the Wyndham and Bennington CUDs have been in, um, 
uh, they're in close contact um, and and in discussions about this, you know, just constantly. So, uh, you know, monitoring what's going on. And, and as I said, you know, Bennington is also, I know they're looking northward as well. You know, where are the opportunities to get these things done? Can I ask a technical question? If everywhere is wired, like, you know, wired to the home, um, will I be able to have cell phone service? You'll have cell phone service like, in your home. I know I have cell phone service in my home. It's really nice, but I, I know some other legislators in order to stay healthy, sometimes have conference calls while they go for walks. And that's a future that I would like to yeah. imagine. Um, or, you know, being able to get my voicemails at home, I have to go to the grocery store to get my voicemails for some reason. Um, so is <laughs> like, are there ways that those technologies can talk to each other in a, like while you're, Driving, is yeah, that gonna so, happen? Why do we have two totally separate? Why do we have two? Oh, well, I don't know if I can go with the why. Good question. I don't know if I can go with the why, uh, but the cell, I mean, cell is a different technology. Yeah. Um, it, re it really is. Um, and there has been um, massive, and it's different, and cell is different than wireless too, also, by the way. Uh, and so, there has been massive investment in cell, massive federal projects in cell that should theoretically um, be really improving the situation for Vermonters. I definitely have seen um, improvements uh, in the Deerfield Valley uh, out where I'm at, um, pretty significant improvements. Well, there's yeah. a really strong difference in wiring your, in having phone service for tourists, right? There's Say it again. There's a what? There's a really strong business interest in having um, cell service in your area because you have so many tourists coming through. Well, I mean, we had it in Wilmington. We had it in Dover. Um, we got it in East Dover after Irene because, you know, we, all of the regular phone lines were gone. Um, but uh, uh, we've recently gotten it through um, some small cell investments with AT&T um, working with uh, BTEL on the towers that um, that were funded through uh, in, in ERA. So we're finally seeing some benefit to those um, in uh, Wyndham County. Uh, smaller cell technology, so shorter um, shorter areas. The other uh, piece with AT&T, AT&T was funded another one of these massive, um, and I'm not going to have the billions of dollars correct, um, but FirstNet, this first responders network, and that was something built out in response to 9-11 um, to um, because you know all of the cell networks were overwrought so this is uh, intended to make sure that all of our providers are able to access um, and have priority access to um, to cell networks in the event of an emergency with an asterisk because by all we mean um, all of the ones in heavily populated areas and maybe there will be some for you know some of the rural areas you know, of course, when I looked at the maps for that big hole over, you know, central southern Vermont, shocking. So, but that's gotten better. They've gotten better. So, but no, Emily, the CUDs I don't think are going to affect your driving. Um, your driving. Um, I feel like I should be able to sort of jump from like I should be able to sort of like surf on the. I don't know. I'm making up magic technology yes. inside my head. The Senate would like to uh, influence uh, cellular policy with their bill. And um, it really is a totally, it's different. We don't have community cell phone um, folks right now. You know, so. I will. I will be patient. <sighs> yes. One technology <laughs> at a time. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of laughing um, about this conversation in general because for our listeners, I will do the best I can when I, I edit this, this video to help with sound quality. But every now and then you will hear our sound gets a little wonky. wonky. And yeah. it's totally the internet signal right now. Um, I'm in a place right now with lots of wind that tends to, to mess up the internet signal. I think Laura, if I remember correctly, just down where, where your office is located, it doesn't have some of the strongest 
I can never get a cell service for down there for right. one thing. Um, and we know Emily has some, some patchy um, bits to her, her connectivity as well. And so, yeah, even, even a, an interview like this, which people have been doing all throughout the pandemic, uh, we haven't gotten through it one without of the, an internet right. hiccup. All right, one of the gloriously funny things that happens on the house floor, which we're doing all via Zoom, um, is that I think in every bill report about about any broadband bill, Laura loses her <laughs> like every, it's amazing. Like even when she's making announcements sometimes, it's really yeah. just like it's as if she is choreographing it. It's yeah. incredible. It's absolutely yeah. Like to keep, I, when people say, oh yeah, we're losing you, I'm like, yeah, yeah just keeping me hungry, keeping me motivated. <laughs> <laughs> I love Patchy Bits, Olga. I love that. That should be the name of something, Patchy Bits. Patchy Bits. Yeah, yeah I, I, I might write that down. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that. <laughs> um, we are just near the end of our show, but I want to check in with both Emily and Laura. Is there anything you just want to leave listeners with? Actually, yeah, I have something for listeners that's not related to broadband. Um, and it's that I know that pensions are very much in the news right now and are very much a very complicated and very emotional topic for lots of folks. And so I feel um, a little uncomfortable that that's not what we're talking about in the happy hour this week, but we tend to book things in advance so that our guests will have time to join us. And so know that that's something that we are thinking about and we'll talk about in the future. And you are, um, there are many other ways to find me to talk about them. And I'm, you know, writing about it in my newsletter and all those other places, so. Wonderful, thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. Laura. Yeah, I think we will continue moving along on broadband policy uh, in the house, at least looking at um, taxation, how that's organized, um, looking at policy around privacy and AI. Um, you know, all the crazy stuff that's going on IT, so. Well, thank you. Well, I want to toast today on the happy hour because we always like to end with a toast. I want to toast all the volunteers yes. in these CUDs who have been digging in to make life better for the rest of us. Here's 100%. to you all. Here's to you. Volunteers that keep Vermont running. Mm-hmm. Thank you for joining us today on the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us at the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page, our website, the Montpelier Happy Hour .fm, as well as Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Emily, where can folks find you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can find a link to all of my social media accounts, my blog, sign up for my newsletter, or just find my phone number or email address. And Laura, where can folks find you if they have questions? LauraSibiliaVT.com. Wonderful. Have a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>